All right, last week we had uh, concluded by looking at uh, Luke and particularly the section from 951 through 1927 as uh, Jesus was preparing then, according to the narrative, to enter on into Jerusalem. But as he did, he was on the way to Jerusalem. And uh, as we saw last week, it seems as though in particular during these chapters as an emphasis by Luke on what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Their duties, who they were, and uh, particularly their future. And uh, two interpretive issues, one where he interacts with his disciples, and uh, then one where he interacts with Pharisees, and after that interaction, he interacts with his disciples. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, we have a, a situation that is unique to Luke. Uh, it is the sending out now of 70 disciples. Now, this is not the sending out of the 12 that has been also seen in Matthew 10 and uh, in Mark 6, uh, as is ministry, Jesus' ministry was coming to a close in Galilee. Toward the end of that public ministry in Galilee, he sent his 12 disciples out, 12 apostles, two by two. Uh, now, as he's on his way to Jerusalem, and uh, particularly before this, in uh, Luke chapter 9, we saw last time, verses 51 through 56, that he is uh, seeking to go through uh, Samaria, he sends messengers ahead of him in verse 52, and the Samaritans did not receive him. Why? Because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And uh, so they, they allowed religious differences to cloud their understanding of who Jesus was. But he's on his way to Jerusalem, he's going through Samaritan territory, ultimately Perean territory. Uh, Judea, as well as being in uh, areas of Galilee at times. This is all what is, is uh, pictured in this uh, last year of Jesus' public ministry that uh, is recorded in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, all the way till he finally comes to Jerusalem in chapter 19. And so uh, now it's not just Galilee, time is short. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die and ultimately ascend into heaven. And uh, the, the, the challenge of discipleship, as we saw last week, verses uh, 57 to 62 of Luke chapter 9, is very, very difficult. That uh, few were willing to, uh, to face the, uh, the all-out commitment that uh, was involved in being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so time is short and followers are few. And uh, so along with what he did in Galilee chapter 9 and chapter 10, he sends out 70, sent them two and two ahead of him. And so now literally there are 35 different, if we might put it this way, discipleship teams. And uh, once again, uh, with the same backdrop as seen in Galilee, verse 2, the Harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The same challenge that was given to the twelve toward the end of the Galilean ministry is now given to more disciples of Jesus Christ. And he sends them out with basically the same kind of commission and uh, the same kind of, of power uh, validating their message as he did for the 12 in, in Galilee. They too, as uh, you can uh, see, were to, were to, to go forth and, uh, and uh, proclaim uh, the message of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and as they, uh, they did, their, their message uh, was to be... Uh, in the same way, validated in, uh, in verse 9, heal those who are sick and say to them, the kingdom 
of God has come near to you. And so he, uh, he sends them forth. And then in verse 17, And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You know, you sent us out to, with your message, with the, with the validating miracles, and so they rejoice in the fact that there is submission on the part of uh, the demons in Jesus' name. That uh, they have this authority because of Jesus' authority, seen in his name. And they have been sent forth as his representatives. And so they are acting as Jesus was able to act. And he says, verse 18, to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. So he's going back to their joy in verse 17. Don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Don't have your joy be the fact that demons are now in subjection to you as my representatives, as uh, you are acting in my authority, in my name. Don't rejoice in this, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. There's something, there's something that's more joyful than being used here as the Lord's representatives on earth, and that is that one is certain that uh, their name has been recorded in heaven. And of course, ultimately when the Lord returns from heaven to establish his kingdom, that they'll be part of that kingdom. That's what you should rejoice. You should rejoice over your relationship with me and the, and the eternal benefits of that, not the temporal benefits that you are seeing being my representatives here upon the earth. Now, certainly their authority was only to, and was only temporal to the time of uh, their ministry. I have given you. So there was a point in the past when this authority was given that continues to have uh, present, uh, uh, ex present experience. They have seen it take place. But uh, there is no guarantee with, this verse, with verse 19 that they are going to continue to have this authority you know, into the, the distant future. In uh, fact, it would seem, since these are not the 12, that uh, once this this particular ministry was over, then this uh, particular blessing that they were experiencing would, uh, would be taken away. But it's in verse 18. And it seems to be tied in with the demons being subject to these representatives of Jesus. That in, in their subjection to you, Jesus says, I was watching Satan, that is, the leader, the ruler of the demons, fall from heaven, and then notice, like lightning. Now, the majority position is that uh, this is inceptive. That with this ministry of these 70, that the authority, the validation that undergirded Jesus as the Messiah and the beginning of the kingdom of God, i.e. in a spiritual, in its a spiritual foundation, uh, verse 20, rejoice your names, are recorded in heaven, that, that this inauguration had begun. And so as, as their literal ministry was taking place at that time, that time, Jesus was saying, I was watching Satan fall 
from heaven like lightning. And so this is inceptive. The, the aorist participle, basically, Satan was beginning to fall and will continue to fall until the complete consummation of his fall that will be in the future. And uh, this is the majority way that it is taken today. As opposed to a more traditional understanding, which uh, you can see echoed in the, uh, the notes of the MacArthur Study Bible, that uh, this aorist is a historic event. In fact, it's historic past events. That as, as the demons were subject to you, I was watching in that subjection as it were a replay of the actual fall from heaven of Satan, i.e. that echoes what is in Isaiah chapter 14. I'll go back to the 502 notes. I've got some questions about whether uh, Isaiah 14 is about the literal fall of uh, Satan uh, before the, uh, the fall of, of man. I think rather what uh, is being stated here, and particularly like lightning. We're going to see when we come to chapter 17 that like lightning is going to be an expression that means it is seen. Like lightning from one side of the sky to the other. Lightning is publicly visible. Now you could say, well, the demons were subject. That was visible. Yes, but what was not visible is as the demons were being subject, to these representatives of Jesus, these 70 disciples, uh, no one saw publicly the fall of Satan. Satan wasn't falling. So I was watching. Now, the only difference between my viewpoint and Dr. MacArthur's is we're both talking about historical event, but he sees the historical event in the past. But remember the heiress at times and and how strictly we, we emphasize the heiress with a, uh, a participle as being used here. That's also a, a grammatical a discussion. But heiress can also look at something historically that is, that is taking place or will take place in the future, what we call the prophetic or proleptic use. And uh, I was watching Satan fall like heaven, like lightning and uh, go over to Revelation chapter 12. Because when it comes to Satan's fall being publicly seen upon the earth, uh, well, take a look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Now, the, uh, the uh, context, verse 7, there was war in heaven. And the dragon and his angels waged war against Michael and his angels. And they, that is the dragon and his, ange and his angels, were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Who is the great dragon? The serpent of old who is called the devil. And Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And by the way, this is something which is publicly recognized, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, that is Israel, etc. And so this, this uh, context in, in Revelation chapter 12 anticipates a time where Satan, who has access to heaven to, uh, to um, uh, reproach the saints, to, uh, uh, to call out the saints, right, that he is cast out of heaven, thrown out from heaven, and it's something which is, is public because we then see a demonstration of his actions is thrown to the earth upon the earth. And uh, so I believe that when 
Jesus is talking about, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. It's, it's what he is seeing is anticipation of what was taking place through the ministry, the experience of the 70. This as it were, no, he wasn't hitting the video to look back, but uh, he was looking ahead uh, at, um, at uh, what will take place with Satan historically in the future. And uh, uh, the newer commentary by Garland uh, leans toward that position, although he takes the inaugurated kingdom position as, as well. But uh, what leads me there is not so much the arguing from the tense of the participle as it is that uh, it is described as, as an event that is like lightning, that is, that is publicly seen upon the earth. Now against that backdrop, let's take a look at Luke chapter 17. And Luke chapter 17 might be the most, uh, the most discussed interpretive issue in the book. Now we are on his last literary step, chapter 17, verse 11. And we're told again that Jesus was uh, on his way to Jerusalem. Once again, we have a Samaritan, but now not a Samaritan who rejects, but a, a Samaritan whose faith has saved him. And then in verse 20, that having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. So their question is, when can we anticipate the establishment of the kingdom upon the earth? When is the kingdom of God coming? He answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming literally with observation. The kingdom of God is not coming with that which can be visibly, literally, by the eyes of men seen. Now, gentlemen, right away, you need to realize that within the context of the Gospels, certainly when the kingdom of God comes, it will be seen. It's going to be manifest. In fact, uh, take a look at verse 24 when he talks to his disciples after the Pharisees. For just as the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So when the Son of Man returns to establish his kingdom, it's going to be clearly observable by friend and foe. It's clear, just like lightning. But he answers the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is not coming with observation, nor will they say, look here or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in toss you. It's inside you. Now, that's to the Pharisees. Now, it's very interesting, the important thing about when. When was the kingdom of God coming? Well, when it comes, it's going to be visible, Jesus says to his disciples. But then notice in verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. All right, when he comes, it's going to be publicly seen. But when, it's not going to take place until after the rejection by this generation. Now, who is part of the generation who is rejecting Jesus as Messiah? The Pharisees. Uh, you can go back uh, through the 
through the, the Gospel of Luke, and particularly from chapters 11 on to this point, that we see and again and again how Jesus and the Pharisees are in conflict, not just in Galilee, but also as Jesus is on his way to uh, Jerusalem. In fact, it is uh, significant in chapter 11 uh, that in verses uh, 14 to, to 26, here's where we have the unpardonable sin. And it takes place, for in Luke's gospel, on the way to Jerusalem. So, by the way, the fact that uh, he is, uh, he is uh, accused of casting out demons by Beelzebub, uh, Matthew chapter 9, all right, that was during his time in Galilee. Matthew chapter 12, the culmination of his Galilean ministry. And once again here on the way to Jerusalem. So, you know, don't think all of a sudden as Jesus is now going to Jerusalem, it's not that the Pharisees back off. It's the fact that the Pharisees now are more intensified in their opposition to, uh, to Jesus. And so they're questioning him. And uh, certainly Luke doesn't give any indication of why they were questioning to question him, but Jesus has made it clear he's on his way to Jerusalem, he's on his way to die. So if the Messiah is on his way to Jerusalem to die, when is the kingdom going to come? And here's my interpretation for these Pharisees. He answered them. This is not an answer to the multitude, to his disciples, this is not a continuing answer for Theophilus and Gentile believers. This was Jesus' answer to the Pharisees at that historic point in his ministry. They want to know when the kingdom of God was coming. Well, the kingdom of God, when it comes, you Pharisees will not see it. Why? Because you're part of the generation that, uh, that is going to reject me. So the kingdom is not going to come to this generation. It's going to come in the future. Which means for you, you're not going to see it. Nor will they say, look here or there. Don't, don't look at other messianic pretenders. For behold, where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is inside of you. And it's true that he uses here a a, a preposition that is not widely used in the New Testament or in Greek literature. Obviously, N is, is much more prevalent. And this seems to have the particular emph emphasis upon the fact that something is inside. Uh, it's used in uh, 23, 26 of the inside of a cup. Right? So, what you have is, okay, you got the contents of a cup and you got the cup surrounding it. So the basic idea is, all right, the kingdom in some way is surrounding these Pharisees who find themselves in the middle of that which surrounds them. And so the, uh, the kingdom. Now, does that mean that inside means literally inside each individual Pharisee? Well, the kingdom is not inside an individual. In fact, uh, Marshall puts it very, very well that throughout the Gospels, the kingdom is never spoken about as being inside people. The kingdom doesn't come into people. Rather, people come into the kingdom. All right, so it doesn't seem to be inside these Pharisees. 
But is Jesus saying at this point that even though you don't have it in your midst, it really is a spiritual phenomena that is in the hearts of people, that is inside. Uh, the kingdom of God is inside your midst. Now, it's not inside you Pharisees, but uh, that's basically where it is found. Now, you'll notice that uh, even though this has been a, and, and probably I would say uh, throughout the, the church tradition very, very early, and on into the 20th century, a predominant, the predominant interpretation, uh, you'll notice that uh, most commentators today steer away from it because of the context of the Pharisees. And uh, so behold, the kingdom of God is in, in, in your midst, inside of you. And, uh, and some would say, well, it's possibly within your grasp or power. But okay, what is around you as it is, as, as your hand then, and, and that which is inside. No, so the kingdom of God is, is within your grasp. It is there for your taking. But again, it doesn't seem as though that's the point because they're not going to see the kingdom. So if they don't grasp it, they're not going to enter it. So it seems best... To, to see this as being, it is in the midst. In the midst, as it were, of the disciples. The kingdom of God is in your midst in the sense of among you. That uh, the kingdom is inside of you all. And I don't know how visual it could be, but here is Jesus, and as it were, surrounded by Pharisees, putting the question to him, and he's basically saying, you're not going to see the kingdom, and don't be looking other places, because it's not there. In fact, right now, as I'm speaking, where is the kingdom? In the person of the king? Right in the midst of you. Right inside, as it were, of the, uh, the circle has even circled me uh, asking this question. So I would see and emphasize the, the plural that the kingdom of God is inside y'all. Must be a southerner here. So it's inside y'all. It's right here, the one speaking to you. But you're rejecting me as Messiah. And you're part of this generation that's not going to see the kingdom, because the kingdom is going to come in the future. And then significantly in chapter 19, the final parable, he says, on his way, as he continues, because he was near Jerusalem, he went on to tell a parable. Why? Because they supposed the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And that they were in that context, probably, is uh, most immediately his disciples. They, they thought they were on the way to Jerusalem for the kingdom. And uh, the parable is about a man who went away to get a kingdom and left his, his uh, servants and uh, gave them a stewardship while he was away. Uh, so as we come to the very end of uh, this section, a reminder of the disciples, the kingdom is not going to be established now. I'm not on the way to Jerusalem to establish the kingdom. I'm on the way to Jerusalem to be rejected and uh, be rejected by this generation and only in the future will uh, finally the Son of Man return and uh, will the, the kingdom be established here upon the earth. All right, let me finish it and then we can take some questions uh, before we go on break. All right, so the, the ministry of, uh, of uh, Jesus on the way to Jerusalem comes to an end, uh, 1927, and then in 1928, Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem. It is uh, significant that uh, in chapter 19, 28 to 48, we have his entrance into Jerusalem, and uh, then we have in chapter 20, verse 1 through 2136, we have the question of his authority. 
and uh, and then in the very end of uh, of uh, the chapter, we uh, uh, we find that during the day he was in the temple, verses thirty-seven and thirty-eight. But in the evening, he would go and spend the night on the Mount of, of Olives. Then in the, the final epilogue, we, uh, we basically have the, the, the echo of what is in 1928 to, uh, to 2138. We have, uh, we have Jesus uh, coming into Jerusalem, 22 verses 1 to 38. And uh, then we have the whole issue of authority, who has authority over Jesus. Jesus only shows he has authority over the religious leaders. And his ultimate authority is seen in his resurrection. And uh, then echoing what we have at the end of chapter 21, at the end of chapter 24, uh, we, we find that uh, in uh, verses uh, uh, 52 and 53, the disciples now returned to Jerusalem and were continually in the, and continually in the temple praising God. Uh, so they, like Jesus, uh, continue on in the temple and, uh, and uh, are prepared them for the events that are going to take place in the book of, uh, of Acts. Now, certainly in chapter 19, with his entrance into Jerusalem, we, uh, we see the rejection of, um, of Jesus in, uh, in uh, verse 39 as he is being declared to be, chapter 19, he's being declared to be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In verse 39, some of the Pharisees and the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones would cry out. And, um, and then as he approaches the city, he weeps uh, because the city does not know that day of visitation and therefore judgment is coming. And in verses 45, 46, it's business as usual in the temple. And so he entered in the temple, began to cast out those who were Selling. Now we know it took place the day after, but Luke telescopes it here uh, to show the, the rejection of the Pharisees, the rejection of the religious leaders in the temple. They did not know this was the day that Messiah was uh, unveiled publicly, nationally for Israel, and uh, therefore Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Uh, chapter uh, 20. In the beginning of chapter 21, uh, we see again the, Jesus being attacked as far as where his authority comes from. And uh, then Jesus uh, reiterates in uh, chapter 21, verses uh, 5 through 36, that, um, uh, that uh, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And, um, and this anticipation of Jer Jerusalem's destruction is until the time of the Gentiles be done, and then ultimately Jesus will return once again uh, publicly to be seen. Uh, in uh, 21, 7, uh, they, uh, 27, they will see the Son of Man coming in cloud with power and great glory. So when he returns, it's, it's going to be public. Everybody's going to, to see it. And so we, uh, we see here Luke's uh, recounting of the Olivet Discourse, that uh, judgment is certainly coming upon Jerusalem, but that does not stop Jesus Christ ultimately returning to establish his, uh, his kingdom with power and great glory in the future. Against that backdrop, just like the other Gospels, then we have in chapters 22 to 24, we have the events of his death, resurrection, and ascension. And we've already seen particularly emphasized twice in uh, Luke chapter 24, that these things must take place in this way because this was the fulfillment of Scripture. Messiah had to die so that the message of salvation might go forth from Jerusalem and uh, go to the Gentiles 
as well. And so uh, Luke's gospel comes to an end. Volume 1 is complete. And uh, remember the purpose was that uh, Theophilus could be assured that the things he had been taught, going all the way back to Jesus, that uh, it was uh, God's will that, uh, that Jesus' salvation was not to be just for Israel, but that message of salvation was to go to the Gentiles as well. But uh, that goes right back to, to Jesus and uh, Jesus' words and Jesus' determination himself. All right, any questions on uh, Luke and particularly these uh, two interpretive issues that we've spent most of uh, this first hour looking at together? Any any questions? Uh, the kingdom of God is within you. Is that a common verse? Um, going back to our prior discussions from Matthew for the spiritual kingdom mm -hmm. of you. And it's a primary verse, and of course why it has been so predominant is uh, for those who, uh, well, Two groups, one that believe that uh, the kingdom is only spiritual. That as Jesus came, he redefined the kingdom as not being a spiritual slash literal reality, physical reality, but, uh, but only being spiritual. And here's the essentials. And of course, you can look at a commentator like William Hendrickson, you know, to get that, uh, that viewpoint. So, so, that, uh, so this was an emphasis to the Pharisees that the kingdom, you're looking for a kingdom that's to be seen visibly. But the only kingdom that's coming is the kingdom that's going to be spiritual. That is not seen physically in that sense, but uh, is inside of the human heart. So even again, they wouldn't say it's inside the Pharisees. It's not in their heart, but this is the basic truth. It's going to be... Uh, that which is not seen, but within the heart. And that's why I wanted to go to the greater context, that if you just say the, uh, the kingdom is spiritual, now, to say with Hendrickson, Hendrickson would say, well, very definitely when Christ returns, everyone is going to see that. It's going to be a phenomenon seen by all. But, uh, but he wouldn't necessarily say at that point that Jesus is coming to establish the kingdom. Now, there are those, uh, remember a couple of weeks ago I read from Sam Storms, the earthly amillennialist. Right, again, the emphasis that the, the inaugurated kingdom is the spiritual kingdom, which will, which will culminate in a, in a, in a uh, um, physical manifestation. And he would say that would take place in the new heavens and new earth. So the kingdom is not in his in his understanding, you know, spiritual, it's just like us, it has a spiritual component, a spiritual foundation, but ultimately will have a physical manifestation of uh, the consummation. And of course, this also fits with those who would be covenantal premill as well, that the kingdom established, although most of the covenantal premills today take three for this particular passage. So, uh, so Stein, uh, Garland would be Amil. Um, uh, I, forget, I'll, I forget who did EBC, I think it was uh, Liefeld, um, would be, I, I think, a covenant pre-mill. Uh, they, uh, they would say the same thing, that uh, the emphasis here is, here is the king, and you need to be spiritually related to the king when the king comes, inaugurate a kingdom, and when it's established, um, you will enter that kingdom. Uh, Marshall would be, would be ah mill, but he would see, well, he would see the spiritual kingdom as uh, being present today in the church. But that kingdom doesn't enter you, you enter that kingdom. So even those who would more emphasize the spiritual kingdom today would still, uh, as far as exegetes are concerned, be found with position three and no longer position one. But that's not historically, uh, that, that's, been a, that's been a turnaround from the historical tradition. Uh, position two, as you can see, everyone who even brings it up, there's a question mark uh, that the, uh, the unique emphasis here might be within your grasp or within your power. 
that with the with the king present, the kingdom in some way is is in your grasp. You can respond, um, but uh, but that's a minority of viewpoint as far as the uh, grammatical understanding is concerned. First um, point that we were talking about in terms of uh, difficulty. Um, do you think, I, I might have been misunderstanding you, but do you think it's legitimate to say that Jesus was talking about the advancement of his kingdom? Well, not necessarily his kingdom. I know you wouldn't agree with that because the kingdom isn't on earth yet, but um, with you know Satan's kingdom falling as a result of the ministry of the 70 going out. And, and like the highly visible results of that effort, I guess, that Jesus, you know, did through the 70. I mean, is that totally off track? Or what are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, my thought on that, okay, the, the question is, is, is wasn't there a, a public demonstration of, as you said, the, the decline of Satan's kingdom and the establishment of Christ's kingdom? Uh, and um, is that what was being seen by the, by the authority? And uh, that, is, that is possible, of course, if you see that, um, that the kingdom in some way was present beyond just the person of Jesus. And, and certainly, certainly the miracles, we've already said, said that, the, the, the validating miracles are a microcosm of, of, of what the kingdom is going to look like. So is there a sense in which there is a public demonstration of the kingdom? Well, yes, the, the miracles are a public demonstration of the kingdom. But uh, significantly, what we see Jesus saying to the, to the 70 is, it's not that I was, you know, that I was seeing um, my kingdom visibly like lightning you know, starting to take over, he's saying, I'm seeing, I was seeing Satan. Now, Satan has been in the context. All right, how do you see Satan fall like lightning? How do we understand that somehow this is, uh, the, the, well, the falling, literally, I think, you know, Revelation 12 makes more sense, the casting out of Satan from heaven to the earth that has a public manifestation upon the earth. To me, it just makes you know better sense. Now, uh, certainly, if you're inaugurating a kingdom and this is the beginning of the overthrow of Satan's kingdom, that is going to only you know grow and intensify during this age and then culminate when Jesus Christ returns, which is the majority position day, the inceptive. This was the beginning of Satan's fall, which will be culminated as seen in Revelation chapter 12. So. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if there's an inaugurated kingdom, then there is a physical manifestation in the uh, in, in the uh, the casting out of uh, the demons and uh, the healings. This microcosm is showing the power of Christ's kingdom and the diminishing power of Satan's kingdom, and that which is inaugurated continues on during this age and then is culminated when Christ returns. So that's position uh, two. Uh, well, uh, James, be careful. Now, I want to say random. <laughs> Certainly, he's got a connection. <laughs> All right, there you go. To me, it seems random. That's better. Let's, let's not accuse Jesus of being random at this point. Okay. <laughs> Talks about demons and he talks about Satan and it, how does that connect? 
Well, obviously, Luke is going to have another occurrence of that in chapter 11 on the way to Jerusalem. So, yes, there, James, I think you have to say that before and after this incident recorded in Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus Christ is saying, you know, if I am publicly demonstrating my authority over demons, that has something to say about, you know, my authority over Satan. All right, I have no problem with that, yes. And uh, so, so the fact that he can go right from your authority over demons to talk about Satan, I wouldn't say that's unusual because before and after this event, uh, and if, if you haven't read the other Gospels, all right, Luke 10, by, by the time you get into Luke 11, all right, you're going to see this connection again. Demons, Satan, all right, that, uh, that Jesus can infer from what is taking place with demons what is true about Satan. So, I, yeah, I have no problem with that. Now the question is, what is the relationship, what's the inference that he's drawing from what he sees with the demons and, and uh, Satan? Now certainly for the, uh, you know, the, the blasphemy against him to say that he's doing this under Satan's power. All right, no, once again, the, uh, you know, the kingdom is present there, that is in the person of the king and the microcosm through the miracles that are taking place, including his authority over demons, shows his ultimate authority over Satan, but not a an authority which is then publicly manifested. That awaits the future. So even though I take position three, I can see some value in the inceptive. In other words, what's going to take place in the future, Jesus is showing presently his authority over the demon shows his authority only over Satan, which guarantees only what has been prophesied of his authority over Satan. Satan being cast out and uh, the world knowing that is, is only, is, is only uh, assured by, you know, what was taking place at that time. But, but the future, or I should say, the, the experience that he talks about with Satan is still something that awaits the future. This, this is not the time when Satan's kingdom is completely overthrown and Christ's kingdom is completely established.